Um, so my name is Jim Thomas. I work for the Etc Group, which is an international organization that uh, tracks emerging technologies and looks at the power relations that come out of that. And um, one of the areas we've been looking for a long time is biotechnology. That is, uh, you know, the manipulation of life. And, uh, you know, I'm from the early 1970s. I was born in 1973. Um, and at that time, um, there was a brand new biotechnology called transgenics. And basically, it's cutting and pasting DNA. It's uh, the so-called code of life from one organism to another, just in the same way as that you cut a piece of a tape from a cassette tape and you put it into another cassette tape. It's an analog technology. Well, speed forward to the 21st century, and transgenics is old hat. We're no longer using this cut and paste technology as the cutting edge. Um, there's a whole new set of uh, techniques called synthetic biology. And um, what synthetic biology is, allows you to build organisms, the DNA of organisms, from scratch. So with transgenics, what you used to do was you'd have to take the DNA out of an existing organism, and then cut out the little piece of DNA that you want and then paste it across. Um, but DNA is just a chemical. Um, it's made up of four, it's a molecule, it's made up of four chemicals, guanine, thiamine, adenine, and cytosine. Um, and here they are, these are the four chemicals. This is, uh, this is them, you can see them. Um, and so if I get these four chemicals and I, uh, I go to a chemistry lab, I can build DNA synthetically as a synthetic molecule. And then I don't have to go into nature anymore and find it. But in fact, I don't even need to go to a chemistry lab. I can get a machine that's about this big, um, and it's called a DNA synthesizer. And a DNA synthesizer will take these four bottles, um, and it will put together the G, T, A, and C into a strand of DNA, just as I want it. So if I want a DNA strand that says G, T, T, C, C, A, T, G, it will build that synthetic strand. And in fact, I don't even need a DNA synthesizer. I can go on the internet, and I can order any strand of DNA that I want, thousands of base pairs long, thousands of letters long, and um, it will cost me about 50 cents per base pair. Um, so what does that mean? That means I could, for example, order synthetically all the DNA of a polio virus, and uh, I would have a working polio virus that was built from these chemicals, and um, that would cost me around uh, $3,000 US dollars. Um, it means that if I wanted to, uh, I could... Uh, I could ask for a piece of DNA that goes G, T, T, C, C, A, T, C, G, G, and so forth that does a specific thing. Um, so for example, that will turn an organism green. And um, then I can order that piece of DNA and I can genetically engineer it into an organism, say for example a bacteria, and uh, the bacteria will start to glow green. And I haven't had to go and find the DNA in nature. Um, take this one step further, I can build new strands of DNA using these four chemicals um, that have never existed in nature. In fact, I can build a piece of DNA that will make everything turn yellow, and that's a piece of DNA that, that didn't exist in nature. And so you move away from uh, this analog cutting and pasting of building ex from existing DNA to uh, building DNA from scratch in a kind of digital way. Ultimately, all you need is a computer. You specify the bits that you want, you order it over the internet, and then you just pop it into an organism. So building synthetic organisms, building new designer organisms, becomes tremendously simple. Is that legal? Is that legal? Yes, that's legal. It's very legal. In fact, there are thousands and thousands of people who do build synthetic organisms. There's every year, there's a competition between high school students to build the funkiest, coolest synthetic organism. It's called the International Genetically Engineered Machine Competition. And uh, they build things like uh, bacteria that take photographs, or bacteria that smell of bananas, or bacteria that flash different colors. A lot of the works with bacteria. Um, <clears throat> there are individuals who build uh, artificial organisms in their own home. They call themselves biohackers, and there are networks of biohackers in the U.S. Who, uh, who are doing genetic engineering as amateurs to kind of create new and unusual um, microbes. And of course there's an industry that's just now growing up that's based on this building synthetic organisms from scratch using computers and programming bacteria as if you were programming a computer program. So a lot of these companies, what they're doing is they're, they're putting new strands of DNA into bacteria and yeast so that that bacteria and yeast produces biofuels, bioplastics, pharmaceutical compounds, um, and, and, and other industrial chemicals. Basically, the business model is that you would have a, a vat full of these synthetic bacteria. Um, you pour in sugar, 
and uh, out the end comes the plastic or the biofuel that you want. So take a company like Amaris Biotechnologies, which is a leading synthetic biology company. They have about 200 employees, and they're in two countries. They're in the US and they're in Brazil. In the US, they're building the microbes that will turn sugar into gasoline and sugar into pharmaceuticals and sugar into diesel that can go straight into a car. In Brazil, they have an agreement with the largest sugarcane producer, uh, which is Santa Lisa Valle, and uh, they have a, a facility in Campina which will then ferment the sugar into gasoline and into diesel that can be sent to Europe to go into cars. Um, so here, these microbes are basically becoming factories for making fuel, and they're using up the sugar from Brazil. And increasingly, they'll move beyond sugar, they'll move to cellulose. Um, that's where ultimately they want to go. So this is an industry that uh, uses these basic chemicals to program DNA as if it was a computer program um, so that microbes will pump out industrial chemicals for plastics and so forth. What's the downside of this? Well, there's a number of downsides with synthetic biology. Um, first of all, you're treating life as though it was a computer program that anybody could make, and that's, that's, that's simply wrong. Um, every time you manipulate life, um, you have big safety questions, and uh, that's particularly true with synthetic biology. You're using sequences of DNA that have been built from scratch that often have never existed in nature. But these are living organisms that you're building. And once those living organisms get out and reproduce, um, you could have all sorts of effects on the environment and potentially on, on ourselves. Um, the limits to what you can produce, well, there are no limits. Um, in 2005, the U.S. Army produced, using synthetic biology, the full sequence of the 1918 flu virus. Um, this was a virus which killed 50 million people in the last century. It was the largest killer of the 20th century, and it went extinct by about 1950. They rebuilt it. They brought it back to life. It's a bit of a Jurassic Park sort of story, um, but with an absolutely deadly killer. And the problem is you can now do that with a number of deadly killers. If you want to build Ebola, or you want to build um, the H1N1 virus, or you want to build anthrax, the sequences, the genetic sequences are available on the internet for free, and then you can start ordering the pieces and building it yourself. So immediately, there's a security risk. Um, and that, that would be bioterror. But of course, you worry then about bioerror. What about the things people are making when they don't realize what they're making? If you're making new sequences and you don't know what's, what they're going to be. Um, you could be making uh, pathogens, or you could be making things that uh, will end up causing massive environmental destruction. In fact, for example, most of the synthetic biology companies are working on trying to turn cellulose into fuels and plastics and jet fuel. Um, but if you have a microbe that can break down cellulose, cellulose is in my shirt and cellulose is in many of the uh, things we use, um, then th and that microbe gets out into the environment, it could cause massive environmental destruction. Um, another major problem with synthetic biology is that it allows you to very easily steal biological resources from one part of the planet. It's a fantastic route for biopiracy. Um, so at the moment, if you want to steal, um, let's say, guarana here in Brazil, um, you would have to go and get an actual sample and smuggle it out of the country and then try and genetically engineer with it. But in fact, if you go on the internet, you can find the, uh, the DNA sequence for guarana and then you can just build it. And then you could put it into a microbe. So a good example of where this is actually happening, there's uh, a company, Amaris, uh, who I mentioned before. Um, Amaris have made a microbe that produces artemisinin. Artemisinin is an anti-malarial compound that uh, is used around the world to fight malaria. And it's produced from a shrub called the wormwood tree, or Artemisia annua. And uh, Artemisia was originally developed by Chinese herbalists, but it's grown by farmers in East Africa and in, in Southeast Asia. Um, by producing a microbe that will produce exactly the same compound in a large vat, um, Amaris uh, are able to undercut the production from, from the bush with a sort of the synthetic version. And as a result, they're going to be undercutting the livelihoods of thousands of small farmers in East Africa, thousands of small farmers in Southeast Asia, um, by effectively stealing away their genetic material, but doing it by the internet. And there's no regulation whatsoever in the world for this? Well, there are existing regulations, very, very poor regulations, around um, genetic engineering and transgenics, um, but they don't fit for synthetic biology because it's not transgenic. There's no material that gets transferred. Um, 
And very often with transgenics, the uh, safety regulations are based on an idea called substantial equivalence. So the idea is you have a soybean and you have a bacteria and you put part of the bacteria into the soybean. It kind of looks like a soybean. It probably is a soybean. It's kind of substantially equivalent. Um, in the case of uh, synthetic biology, you're building entire organisms, sometimes from scratch, using sequences of DNA that have never existed in nature. And there's no way of, uh, of working out the safety of that. Nobody has any protocols for doing that. So we can't build regulations around that. The thing about synthetic biology is it enables an entirely new kind of economy. And it's an economy that basically runs on sugar that you can replace petroleum with sugar by having these microbes that will turn sugar into fuels or sugar into plastics or sugar into chemicals or sugar into pharmaceuticals. So if you imagine this economy where you have lots of large breweries um, that run on sugar, use synthetic organisms to, to pump out plastics and chemicals and uh, um, fuels, um, you, you, what you need for that economy is a large quantity of sugar. Um, you need either cane sugar or cellulose. And so a lot of the work going on in synthetic biology is about trying to liberate cellulose, make it an available sugar. And if that works, if you're able to break down cellulose and turn it into jet fuel, or break down cellulose and turn it into plastic, then you end up with a reason to commercialize um, huge areas of forest, huge areas of grassland, huge areas of ocean. Um, in fact, you have basically a massive grab on the world's biomass. And uh, that's extremely dangerous. The synthetic biology enables an economy where you can grab any green living stuff and turn it into consumer goods. And uh, the price for the environment and for people who depend on the environment is huge. So geoengineering refers to a whole set of technologies that try and manipulate the planet on a geo scale, on the largest possible scale, mostly to try and counter climate change. Now we're in the middle of a climate emergency. Our, our, our atmosphere is warming, um, we're having global warming on a significant scale. And an increasing number of, of scientists and politicians are saying, well, we got ourselves into this mess, we can get ourselves out of it using our own technologies. And so the idea is that um, if we can use technology on a large scale to, to decrease the effect of climate change, then we can get out of the problems of climate change. Global warming boils down to a simple equation. You have uh, sunlight coming in, which interacts with greenhouse gases in the air and creates increased warming. And uh, that increased warming is why we have this, this sort of climate chaos that we're now increasingly concerned about. So if you want to geoengineer your way out of this, you can either reduce the amount of greenhouse gases in the air um, or you can reduce the amount of sunlight coming in to the planet. Um, so the first part of this, of course, we've been trying to reduce the amount of greenhouse gases by reducing emissions. But increasingly, geoengineers are saying, well, let's not worry about emissions. Let's try and find technologies that will suck the carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere. So they're proposing things such as gr growing plankton, large quantities of plankton in the oceans by putting iron nanoparticles into the ocean. That makes plankton grow, and the plankton then soaks up carbon dioxide. The idea being that plankton then dies and takes all the carbon dioxide to the bottom of the sea floor. So that would be a way of sucking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. It's called ocean fertilization. Another idea um, is that you could uh, grow very fast plantations of eucalyptus, for example, burn them without oxygen so that you get charcoal, and bury that charcoal in the soil. This is called biochar. And there's a lot of interest in this as a way of trying to um, bury carbon dioxide in the soil. And then there are other suggestions, for example, the idea of uh, having artificial trees that can uh, soak up carbon dioxide far more effectively than real trees. Um, and there, there are many more examples like how, this. How does that work, the artificial trees? Chemi che it's chemistry. So in that case, what you have is uh, uh, a number of chemicals that are able to pull carbon dioxide out of the air. Um, it requires a lot of energy. It's a very energy um, intensive process. And so it might not be that in terms of the energy that it takes to pull the carbon dioxide out of the air versus how much it takes to run it, it might not be, it might not be worth it.
also for the eucalyptus? Is, is it not good for bad for the soil? Absolutely. Growing huge um, eucalyptus plantations is a very bad idea because they're not forest. They, re they In fact, they end up releasing a lot of carbon dioxide when you clear the forest. Um, and they're monocultures, so and they're monocultures that push people off of the land. So there are very serious problems with that. And then once you put this in the soil, it's not clear what that does for the soil. Um, likewise, the ocean fertilization is a very bad idea because you're messing around with the chemistry and the and the bio, the ecology of the oceans. And in fact, there's now been a. a, a Put a moratorium put in place on doing this ocean fertilization, but there are companies that are trying to do it still. So that's the first thing, is can we suck the carbon dioxide out of the air using some kind of technological fix? The second idea is, well, if we can't stop the gases, why don't we stop the sunlight? That if you can put some sort of uh, uh, umbrella in space, or you can put some sort of particles in the atmosphere, or you can put lots of white things down on the ground, that reflects the sunlight back up into space. And so there's a lot of geoengineering proposals that do this. The most famous is the idea of putting nanoparticles up in the upper atmosphere that will uh, reflect sunlight back into space. And um, in a way, the proof of this is that volcanoes already do this, that when you have a large volcanic eruption, like the Pinatubo eruption a few decades ago, um, you get a massive release of nanoparticles into the upper atmosphere. Um, and for that time, the global temperature goes down because less sunlight is able to reach Earth. So a number of very serious scientists are now saying we would like to put um, nanoparticles artificially in the atmosphere and to keep doing it as a way to bring down temperatures so that we can win us time. It's kind of like a plan B because we're not able to reduce emissions. And um, this would have all sorts of effects as well. It would change rainfall patterns and it would change the weather to do this. Um, you'd end up with many more particles in the atmosphere which would affect people's health. Other proposals are, why don't we uh, put large sheets of white plastic over deserts? If you can put enough large sheets of white plastic over deserts, that would increase the amount of sunlight that's being reflected back out, and that would also um, decrease the warming effect. Of course, deserts are not dead places. There are really complex ecologies and people who live there. And there are suggestions to, to use uh, ships at sea to spray seawater into low clouds. And the idea here is that the clouds will become whiter and they'll reflect more sunlight. And this is a, this is a proposal that's actually got a lot of support um, to artificially make clouds so that, uh, you can, so that you can reflect more sunlight. Once again, there's a number of problems. If you end up with uh, more clouds reflecting more sunlight, you're going to end up with less rainfall. And so less rainfall is not going to be good for agriculture. Um, you're also probably going to change weather patterns. And so there's a number of side effects if these large schemes were to be put in place. And then there's a third area of geoengineering which says if we can't take the gases out of the atmosphere and we can't reflect back the sunlight, well, we may as well try and control the weather. And weather modification has been around for a while. There have been attempts uh, to, to make clouds rain for agriculture. It's been going back to the 1950s and 1960s. Um, but increasingly, there are suggestions that we can also try and stop hurricanes or slow down hurricanes um, or try and make uh, clouds rain so that you can keep hydropower running. Um, so you've got these three strands of geoengineering, these large-scale techno-fixes for climate change. One, try and suck the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Two, see if you can reflect back the sunlight. And three, see if you can do something about the weather. So it sounds nuts, but the idea of geoengineering the entire planet as a techno-fix for climate change is really gaining credibility, particularly as it becomes apparent that governments can't agree to cut emissions of carbon dioxide. Uh, many are increasingly saying, well, why don't we just techno-fix our way out of trouble? Um, all of these schemes have very significant risks, and they're also very unequal. It's the same countries that have caused the problem, the, broadly speaking, the rich OECD countries, that are most interested in having a techno-fix so they can keep their economies running in the same way they always have. Um, and that's an extremely unequal uh, state of affairs. Um, these technologies also, because they affect the entire planet, um, potentially have strong military implications. What, what, who decides whether the temperature goes up and it goes down? Who decides whether which part of the planet is going to get more rainfall and which part of the planet is going to get more drought? Um, those are a huge amount of power to wield, and as yet there's no global discussion about how to regulate and control these technologies. Um, and more than that, once you start down this path, once you start down this path of re-engineering the entire planet on behalf of everybody, you can't stop. That once you put the sulfates up in the atmosphere to reflect back the sunlight, if you were to take them down out the atmosphere, 
the, the temperature would jump up. So you have to keep them there. Once you've started geoengineering, you have to keep geoengineering. And uh, that, that means you're basically deciding the climate for generations to come. Um, it's a very scary prospect.